What is up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Investor Creator. Really happy that you're with us. And today I want to share with you a recording that I just did with David Richter. So David is a fractional CFO. And really what that means is he helps real estate investors grow and scale their business by really understanding the numbers from the financial perspective. So exactly what gross profit is, understanding your cash flows, your burn rate, those kinds of things so that you can effectively scale your business. And so David and I had a really, really good conversation on this concept of profit first. And Profit First was a book that came out, I guess, a couple of years ago now. And David is doing a book called Profit First for Real Estate Investors that's coming out, uh, I think, in December. And so you guys are definitely going to want to check that out. But David has this concept of Profit First for Real Estate Investors. And basically what that means is instead of taking your profit last in the business, you take it off the table first and you allocate a certain amount for expenses. And I think that that's an interesting concept. And so if you're beginning to scale your business or maybe you have a tough time understanding the concept of financial metrics and those kinds of things, you're definitely going to want to listen to this. I learned a few things that I didn't know, even having an accounting background and being a former public tax accountant. So anyway, I think you guys are going to enjoy it. So without further delay, here's me and David. The real estate world is changing. Opportunity is everywhere. It has never been so easy to connect, share, and bring people together. We're learning from others and finding the very best in ourselves. Challenging our beliefs, overcoming our fears, transforming ourselves so we can transform our business. This is Investor Creator. David, welcome to Investor Creator. Thank you so much, Brad. Glad to be here. Been looking forward to this because I haven't had anybody on the show that has really your skill set. And it's something that I've really looked into having a fractional CFO. And I really didn't know what that meant. But first things first. So, like, tell me a little bit about what you're seeing in your clients' businesses with the impact of the market as it stands. Yeah, we're working with quite a few real estate investors and they're all over the country. And it's still in the market today. If you're listening to this, it's what is it's October 2021 and the market is still hot in a lot of places. And a lot of people are able to cash in, able to get the money, you know, that they're looking for, able to turn their deals quickly. And, you know, and I would even say rentals, they're still collecting the rents. And we see all this because we're on the back end. There's no hiding from us. We see the money. We see the numbers as they're flowing through. And that's where we're telling people right now, create those reserves, create a reserve. So that way you can capitalize on any opportunities if the market does start to go south. But we're still seeing it in a lot of the different markets because we are literally working with clients all over the United States right now. It's what we're seeing right now. Yeah. So how did you get involved in this? And what was your background prior to being a fractional CFO? So I will say that I've been in real estate investing myself for about 10 years. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad in college. A good friend gave that to me. And then it was off to the races. I immediately went out on the MLS and with a realtor, looked for a house. You know, I had no idea, you know, the, all the different marketing channels. But so they actually found one. This was like 2012, 2011. So we could still find stuff on HUD Home Store on the MLS that was still foreclosure. So I... I uh, actually bought a foreclosed home. I put work into it, you know, fixed it all up, and then actually lived in it, rented out first a little bit, then lived in it for two years. And then once we moved, lease option the property and put a super tenant in there. He was paid early. It was amazing. And then six months later, he cashes me out, which just blew my mind because then I got the tax free capital gains because I had lived in the house for two years. And so I got this nice check. I'm like, this is good. I needed to keep doing this. So then I linked up with a company, a real estate investing company, and started buying some more of my own deals, like started building a mini portfolio. They were doing about seven wholesale deals a month at the time, and about a team of five to six people, and literally saw that grow from five to six deals a month, seven deals a month, to about 25 to 30 deals by the time over the next five years. And we were doing wholesales, lease options, you know, seller finance. We were doing everything in between, retail sales. So we were doing like the whole gamut of real estate. So I got to see a lot there and I got to sit in every seat. I sat in acquisitions, dispositions, property management, project management, you know, the the accounting department. So I got to see the business from the beginning to the end, the inner working of a real estate company, which was 
way better than even going to college. You know, it's like getting this hands-on experience in this real estate and this real estate company. Then once I sat in the finance seat near the end of my tenure there, I got to see how the money flowed from beginning to the end. And even though we were doing like 25, 30 deals a month, we had about 25 employees at that time and like five virtual assistants. And all, even though we were making six, seven figures sometimes a month, it was all going out the door. That was a huge light bulb moment for me of like, what in the world? We're, we're doing so much. We're going to these masterminds and like, hey, look at this. We're doing 300 deals a year. But then to see it go out the door was like, oh man, that's discouraging. Needless to say, there, there were some major changes that happened in that company. And I was able to sell off my portfolio. We moved across the country actually to be closer to family. I uh, lived in Richmond, Virginia for a while. I started working with another investor there. And the first thing I did was, I need to look at your finances. I need to look at your QuickBooks. I need to look at your numbers. Where are you right now? And then I look, took t- I took a look right then and the numbers were just a mess. Like most real estate investors didn't have the clarity, didn't have anything. So we cleaned that up over the next three months. Then he had this massive clarity and we saw this big hole in his business of like, Hey, you are under leverage on your portfolio of you know some of the properties that you have. So he was able to actually refinance out because now he had that clarity of like he was super under leverage, had a bunch of his own money in there that he had forgotten about and that he didn't even know. And so he was able to take that. And this was before the coronavirus pandemic. And he had a, a bunch of cash he was sitting on for opportunity because at that time no one knew what was going to happen. You know, like what's going is the market going to go up? Is it going to go down? It's going to be Pennsylvania and shut everything off. You know, and so that's where he was sitting on that. And one day he looked at me and said, This has changed my life. Like knowing these numbers has changed my life. And I said, Bing, I got to help more investors help get them that clarity around their finances because I want more of these life changing moments just because you have that clarity around the finances. So that's where Simple CFO was born. And that's where my investing journey has been. And so I've sold my properties, but now it's like getting back into buying some properties now again. And then we moved to Florida recently, so back down here. So we're, uh, yeah, that's my journey so far in the real estate investing world. Very cool. And so at some point, you decided to write the book, Profit First for Real Estate Investors, correct? So yes, that's when I started the Fractional CFO service, I got a call from one of my mentors and was talking with him. And he said, have you heard of the book Profit First? And I said, yeah, it's a great book. You know, I, I've heard of it, but haven't read it. He's like, you should read that book. I think it would be really good for you to read. So I immediately bought that book on Audible, sat down that evening after my wife and daughter had gone to bed and listened to it and took 10 pages of notes and said, this is an amazing framework. And I need to make sure I incorporate this to help real estate investors. And that was another light bulb moment for me was reading that book and saying, you could be the entrepreneur and have clarity. Like you don't need to even have to have the CPA like or someone, you know, dumb it down for you or whatnot or whatever, because I was a simple person. So I needed like the CPA, like, whoa, back that up. Like, what does that mean? So like this system was for the entrepreneur. So I love that. And that's where I incorporated that with the business as one of our pillars. So we incorporated that cash flow system and was inspired, you know, by private first to implement that the cash flow system. And then I went to Mike McCallowitz last year, it was in July of last year and said, Hey, this has been working for real estate investors. I think there needs to be a book specifically for the real estate investing community because, you know, there's nuances, you know, to the actual industry. And he said, yeah, I uh, agree a hundred percent. Let's do this. And so that's been the journey for the last 12, 13 months. Now it's going to release in December and getting the book out profit first for real estate investing. Very cool. So I understand somewhat the concept of Profit First. It sounds simple as a title, but what does it really mean for real estate investors? And can you kind of dive into how that really transitions into practicality? Sure. So I'll give the overall philosophy and then I'll give you the practical steps too. And I'll give you one practical step that if everyone, if once I give this, if you do this one step from this podcast, I promise you will be a more profitable company than you are today. So let me give you the philosophy first, though. First thing is that the accounting world, most of entrepreneurs just like run away once they hear that word. And I totally understand that. But most accountants, CPAs, bookkeepers, they think that the formula is sales minus expenses equals profit. I make a sale. Sounds pretty logical. Pay everyone else and their mother. And then I get to keep what's left over you know, as profit at the end of the year or 
hopefully when I sell the business one day or whatever. Right. And that's where we get into that trap. It's just just like the hustle and grind, like, okay, we always have to be hustling. It's just one of those things that pervades us as like, we're just told that all the time. Like, this is typical, right? That I should be suffering all the time for my business and be just super stressed and working 100 hours a week instead of, you know, I traded 40 hours for 100 hours now, you know, for owning my own real estate business. So then I love the profit first formula where it says, no, it's sales minus profit equals expenses. Meaning I make a sale, I allocate my profit first, and then my business lives off of what is left over. Meaning that I'm building in right from the get-go whenever I start this system, profitability into my company. And I'm not talking about you have to go from zero or negative profit to 30% or 50% or whatever. You just have to start where you are and start that mental shift. The whole purpose of this whole process, this whole philosophy, this whole system is to make profit a habit on every deal, on your whole business, on any rental you acquire, whatever it is, it's building that in and then being able to track it from the cash perspective because everyone has the CPA story of, hey, you made a profit last year. Good job. And you're like, where the heck is it? I don't see that. And like my, You told me I made like 100000 in profit and I see $10 in my bank account. So that's the other thing about this system. It manages the profitability from the cash perspective and from the owner's perspective. So how do you make that profit a habit? There's an actual system. This is what also separates this, why I love it too, is separates it from the Robert Kiyosaki books, from The Richest Man in Babylon, like all these books that are the personal finance or business finance or the different way of thinking where they say pay yourself first and they have that same core message. Profit First also puts into practical steps. Here's what you can do. Have you heard of grandma's envelope system? Well, then now you've heard of Profit First. Instead of using envelopes to segregate out your cash to, for different you know, different things that in your life, you're going to open up different bank accounts to make sure that you have that you can focus on the right things in your business. So what we tell people is there's five main accounts. There's the income account, bank account, that is a checking account. It's just a holding bucket. Income comes in, it sits there until you push it out to the other accounts. So what are those other accounts? I'm a huge nerd. I love movies. I love the epic stories. So I like Harry Potter. Star Wars, you know, they've got the three main heroes like Luke Han and Leia, you know, so you need that in your business too. You need three main accounts. We call it the profit account, the owner's compensation account, and the owner's income tax account, that owner's tax account. So what are those three? They're basically all the profit of the business. That is like the owner's benefit. All three of those go for the owner. So you've got profit, which is the reward for starting your business and the reward for like, hey, I took the risk. I'm now seeing a reward, a return on my money for investing in my time and energy, my sweat, blood, tears, my sleepless nights into this business. Then you've got the owner's compensation, which is for the actual work. If you're still working in the business, you should be compensated for that. Because one day when you're not working in the business, you might transfer that account to like the CEO that runs the show for you while you're in that owner's box. Then the third account that I was talking about, owners, the owner's tax, is if you're if you're going to be wholesaling or not doing a bunch of buy and holds and can't get your in, your income tax all the way down to zero, you need to be saving for taxes throughout the year instead of saying it's tax time. I got to go sell five more houses just to cover this tax bill, and then you then you're taking down horrible deals because now you're putting yourself under the gun. So that kind of helps spread it out too. Then the other account is the operational expense account. So that's the fifth account. You're already paying your expenses. So those five fundamental accounts is what we tell people to set up first. But if you're in real estate, I also say I would set up an OPM account. If you're taking other people's money, private lenders or anyone else, that should not be in the same account as like your operational expenses or your profit or whatnot. You're taking that money and using it for a project, whether that be a rental that you're just fixing up and then you know holding it long term, or if it's a fix and flip project or whatever it is, have an OPM account, separate out other people's money, your rehab funds for you know actual projects. And we like to say reserves, you know, and it just snowballs from there because other people are like, oh, I want to save for this. Like I want to invest in, you know, I want to take down some houses or whatever. Then it's like, okay, when in doubt, add an account. Like, what do you want to save for? What do you want to? Now you get to manage your cash and say, what is an account that is for my business and I can control the flow of my cash now instead of it just being like, there's another month I got to do five deals or I'm going under this month, you know, or I'm living deal to deal. So it's like actually directing your cash. And that's where you set up those 
foundational accounts, you know, that will really help you get a very clear picture from the entrepreneur, from your owner's perspective, because you probably check your bank accounts a whole lot more than you check QuickBooks or your profit and loss or your balance sheet. So it helps you manage from there. And if you're if you're listening to this now and you're saying, David, you're nuts. Are you kidding me? Five, six, seven accounts right now? Like what the heck? This is where here's the you were waiting for the one thing that would make you more profitable today. Open up one account, name it profit, and transfer one percent of your income, the sales that come in. Just transfer one percent just to get into the habit of making of taking that profit first and building profitability. Start where you can. If that's where you can and 99% of it's going out the door, at least do 1% better today. Start that one account and get profitability to be a habit. So there's profit first in a nutshell and how in the profit first for real estate investing, the accounts that I like to set up with people. Really cool. So let's dive into this. So um, let's assume that we have a newer company and and they're, they're doing five deals a year. Okay. So they're not to the point of getting to scale, but they're starting to maybe hire and, and they have some overhead. They have some expenses each month. So how do we allocate across these accounts? And one of the things that, that you know, and, and many people that begin to scale know that is scale always comes at the expense of cash. So how do mm-hmm. we like kind of teeter totter between, hey, we're trying to grow a business and grow something, but we also want to do this profit first model? That's probably the question I get asked the most because people are thinking like, oh, shoot, I want to scale. Like with this system, I'll never be able to scale. And it's what the whole purpose, if you remember when at the beginning I said, the whole purpose is to make profit a habit. So that's really what we're trying to do. Because then from there, what we're really building is that margin of safety, a margin of safety for you and your business to be able to not live deal to deal. So if you want to say, hey, I'm allocating, let's just say 10% to profit now, you know, and we've been doing that for a while, but now I want to hire people. Well, guess what? Instead of 10%, maybe now 5% to profitability, still keeping a profit margin, but maybe now we have to allocate certain percentages from other accounts in order to hire that next person. Because I've got a really good friend, Eddie Wilson, who, you know, he has created kind of like the five stages of a business. And where at the beginning, it's the startup, you know, you're just driving, you're, you're just trying to get it off the ground. Then you've got perseverance, then you've got profitability or viability. Where a lot of people can sit there and be like, okay, I'm profitable. You know, I know I've got that margin. I've got that little cushion, margin or cushion. You could use that same word, cushion of safety here of the cash. And then do I want to go to the fourth phase, which is scalability? And then fifth phase is succession. We won't cover that. But that fourth phase, which is scalability, he says so many people go from perseverance to scalability. They go from just grinding it out every day and saying, you know what? I just need more people to get me out of this hole, or I need to invest more money. And what he likens it to is like putting gasoline or fuel in a plane that's going down. You know, like you might be building this, you might have had a great takeoff, a great startup, but then perseverance, you're kind of leveling out because now you are starting to add people and processes, systems, things start breaking and you're just trying to make it. But then if you pour the fuel on without gaining more altitude and then you just start going down, then you're going to be putting fuel in a, in a plane that's going down, going from perseverance to, to scalability. That's where once you're profitable, now you have options. This has also been so eye-opening working with actual clients because we've had some clients who get to that phase. And I'm sorry, just really passionate about this. This yeah. is where we see some people at that phase that they say, I'm profitable now. I don't want to scale anymore. You know, like they're just, they say, I have the option now of, do I want to make this a lifestyle business and spend time with my family, go on vacations, do all this stuff. Now the business can run without me a lot. And I can actually have more time. The time that I really wanted to create, why I created this business was for money and time freedom. And we've had some people who were before like preaching, oh, I want to scale, scale, scale. Then they get to that spot and they're like, oh no, I kind of like this. And I think that might've just been the masterminds I attend or the you know the pressure I feel from every entrepreneur who wants to just grow and scale. So we've had some people actually say, I like this phase a lot. I like being profitable. And they've kind of slowed down. Then we have some people where they're like, no, this is now it's scale, scale time. Now I do. Now I know where my cash is going. I know how we're directing it. And instead of me scaling and hoping that bringing on more people and getting another CRM, getting another process is going to be the thing, another marketing channel that 
will get us to that next step. They're saying, now I have options. Now I can take a step back. I'm not living deal to deal. And I can say, no, this is where we are right now. This is where the cash is going. I know I can allocate these percentages from here to this one. And then we can turbocharge either hiring a new person or a new marketing channel. And now they're directing it. So hopefully that answers the question of when do we know when to scale and like the people that want to use this system, but still want to scale up as well. For sure. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, one of the things with scale, like I said, is is all, it's always at the expense of cash. Like we have to have mm-hmm. more capital investment on the front to create the systems and marketing deal flow, down payments, depending on what your structure looks like. And yeah. that's a very scary thing for people. So I think this it system is. makes a lot of sense because like you have more, it seems, certainty with the accounting that you're doing to know like exactly what the numbers are going to look like. And it, it's kind of like a built-in savings account. To talk about that, so we have this profit account that now has say X amount of dollars. And I know that for me, it kind of hurts my feelings whenever, you know, we have excess cash in the business that could be going back out earning a rate of return. But I also understand that, again, that's a double-edged sword because we want to have reserves. So can you talk about like what you recommend as a CFO for real estate investors to do with their excess cash and how much in reserves is enough and how do you allocate that? Sure. So I would say profit, we actually open up a separate reserve account from profit because in this world, this framework, this system of profit first for real estate investing, I want the profit account every single quarter, the owner should be drawing from that account, like up to 50% of that, whether to knock down their debt or to take the vacations or to do what they want to do. That profit account should be for the owner to be like, you know what? I actually have a viable business here. You know, I'm actually doing what I wanted to do. I started this business not to have all these problems all the time and to actually take money out and spend time with my family or travel the world or whatever. So mm-hmm. that's where we like to say that profit account is more for that owner and more like that's where we want to get them the reward of having this business. We do say set up a reserve account though that has usually three to six months expenses, depending on their business. It's it's that some people are, you know, want more in, you know, like we've got some people that want like 12 months reserves because they really want to capitalize and they want to make sure their people are taken care of. So like they've just started that. And so having someone to hold them accountable, actually starting an account for that, you know, they've started growing that. But that's what we typically say to people is three to six months reserves. Then with my last point of what I was saying for scaling up, especially if you're in the real estate investing industry. If you have reserves, because a lot of people, I even dedicate a whole chapter of the book to reserves. And I say how reserves will help you help you scale your company. Because so many people think, oh, I could be throwing the money back in to scale the business when they don't realize a lot of the times lenders, other people's money, banks, institutional funding, angel investors, whatever it is, want to see cash in the account. That's the two-edged sword. You know, like, oh, I want to grow and scale, but then also other people's money wants to see the funds you know, in the account. And that's where we've seen a lot of people that we're working with, once they get to that point where they have money, a couple of things have clicked in their heads like, oh, wow, I can take a break and relax and don't have to be on edge all the time. Like I have this cushion of safety. And like, I always thought once I got here, I'd be like, oh, all this money, you know, I'm this type A driver. I just want to have every dollar on the street. And they're the people that are saying, you know what? It feels really good you know, to have cash in this account when I've just been flying by the seat of my pants so far. I think it's a lot because they haven't known anything else up to that point and having someone to help guide them there to get to that point. But then we also have people who are like, no, I want to invest back in. But then we say, okay, how do we want to do this then? You have options now. Do you want to use the money that you have in these accounts? And what is what are you comfortable taking it to with our suggestion, our guidance, you know, like if you're at six months, do you want to take it down to three? If you're at three months, you know, one and a half, you know, like for these opportunities, you know, like what are you comfortable taking it to? Or do you now want to go out and find other lenders? Now, lenders that might lend to you, not just on a deal, but to your business. And now you can use other people's money because now you are showing very cash strong. And it's like, hey, I want to invest in the systems processes people. I have these reserves in place just in case I need to throw my own money in. But now I can go out and find different sources of funding, lines of credit, whatever it might be. That way, and they'll see like, okay, this is a savvy business owner. This is an owner who knows how to be fundable. So that's what we do too. It's like, now we're making the owner more appealing to the outside world if they want to go and not use the cash that they have in those accounts. 
All right. So th- that's a great segue to my next question. So I just listened to a podcast yesterday. Shout out to, I think it's Harry Stebbins, 20 VC podcast. And he, he does venture capital interviews. And so one of the founders of Open Door was his previous guest just, I think, last week. And they have a $10.5 billion valuation, right? Now. And they have $2 million in gap quarterly income right now. As of last quarter, they, they finally turned a profit. Now, they have hellacious revenue, but they haven't quite seen it hit the bottom line. And the, the idea being, well, they're, they're scaling right now. They have so much runway in cash that uh, it doesn't really matter if they're profitable right now. But they finally did turn a profit of $2 million on probably like $250 million in revenue. And I'm looking at this, and I don't know that I understand the valuation model of this, but it's really made me begin to look at raising a good round of capital with venture money. And uh, I've talked to some people in Chicago on that to our business, and and we're Mm -hmm. we're looking at planning that out for probably this next summer. And so what are you seeing in terms of valuations? And I don't even know if this is something that you've seen or if you do it, but like in terms of a multiple... Like what valuations are types of companies are getting, and and even if VC is the right direction to go to raise institutional capital. Sure. Now this is a great question for the people that know what their end goals are too. This is just a plug. If you don't know what your end goals are or where you want to be, this is once you get to this place, you get to you get to clarify that end vision. That's where I was saying the lifestyle business versus selling because a lot of people don't even know if they want to sell the business or if they want to scale that much and have this huge mega business. And that's where it's a personal question to you. What do you want to do? What is really the end goal of this business? Are you looking to sell it? Is it a legacy play? You know, Are you passing this down? Are you looking to you know, just have it be lifestyle? So once you've clarified that, then it becomes more clear. This is the route we need to take for funding? Is it the venture capital route? Like how much are we trying to raise? What is the end goal? Are we looking for tech plays? You know, like are we creating software or something? Because that's a lot more appealing and gets a higher multiple than any other, you know, industry right now that we're seeing. You know, that's the one where it's seeing upwards, you know, 10 plus of their EBITDA, you know, the earnings before their interest in uh, the depreciation and all that, where that's where we're seeing 10 plus of the multiples. But then if you're a real estate company and you've got a good system, it might be five to six times you know, or whatnot. But you've got to have those systems in place. You've got to have those things in place. Knowing what your exit strategy is too, like where do you want to go? Where do you want to take it to? And then having those reserves in place to show the people that, hey, not... Because if you hear on Shark Tank, because this is probably something people can probably relate to a lot is Shark Tank. When they go on Shark Tank, people that they respect the most are usually the people that have saved money and said, oh, I invested $80,000 of my own money into this. You know, like I saved that up and, you know, now we've got some reserves in here and then we've been pouring back into the business, but we're still saving. That's where the sharks see that that's a different type of business owner. That's someone who not only, because come on, venture capitalists, they're not only looking to see if the business is viable, they're looking to see what the owner and the, the leadership of that company is doing right now too. So I would say for the multiples, that's kind of what we were seeing. And then they're really looking for, are they a savvy business owner? What are they doing inside their business right now? What's the differentiator inside? You know, like that was one thing too, when I started going down this route myself, there's a great book, it's called Exit Rich by Michelle Seiler Tucker. And she gives like the six P's of a business, like if you're looking to sell. One of those P's I had really never thought about for my business, it was uh, until several years ago, it was proprietary. You know, like, what do you have that's proprietary to you? Do you have, do you own any intellectual property? Do you own a system? Like, did you build a software from scratch? Did you, like, what do you own that is specific to you? Because that always bumps your multiple up like two or three times, whatever, if you've got something proprietary that is specific to you. So just some of those things that I see when I've been going to a lot of these meetings, a lot of these people that are the venture capitalists up there on the stage and like what they're looking for, but they're really just looking for those solid businesses, the ones that have a head on their shoulders too. Because I've been in several meetings recently too, where they're saying, make sure you pair up with the right venture capitalists, like do your due diligence on the venture capitalists as well too. What businesses have they invested in? What's their success rate? What's their fail rate? What do they do when those companies that fail? You know, it's like just making sure you're asking the right questions of the venture capitalists as well, too, to go that direction. Yeah, I wrote a book, I think it was called uh, Secrets of Sand Hill Road. 
And mm. it talks about the ins and outs of venture capitalists and how many different ways that you can structure a deal in terms of like convertible debt and voting yep. rights and like all of these things that a VC can really, I mean, I was going to say it's, you liken it to a marriage. I don't even think that that begins to cover it. It's like, you can get divorced right. from a marriage. You can't divorce your <laughs> You know what I mean? Like it's, right. it's a, yes. a marriage. And so I look at it and I've talked to some people about this in terms of what we're doing. And about half of them say, Brad, like with what you're doing, I really just recommend you continue down the road. You're, you're going by yourself. So you're not having to contend with other ideas and things that, that may not really like contend well with what you think, you know, and, and may not have those same value systems. And so that's a really interesting thing. But, you know, I've only known what, one other real estate investor to actually sell his business in the past. And so I think that this is something that most people don't even realize that, hey, like, yes, we're making an income for real estate and that's great. But I think honestly, the bigger play is like stabilizing this business as an asset that has its own value. And so yep. can you kind of talk about like, what does that look like in our world in terms of systems? Like at what point does a business become its own entity and its own asset versus just something that provides income for the owner. I am a very simple person, so I want to make it super simple. It is <laughs> the one key factor is the owner tied to the business. Like if the owner were not to be there, would it crumble right away? You know, like what are they tied to? And I think that's probably the most. So and like if because if you've built anything in the even a wholesale business, because I've talked with people, because I'm a part of a lot of different masterminds. And some of them have sold wholesaling companies. And how do they do that? The owner's not tied to any part of the process anymore. They went in there with their head on of, I'm going to build this to sell. So what does that mean? That I have to have the right people. I have to have a profit. I have to have proprietary, you know, like what is proprietary to me? Like, do I have a way of doing things? Like, is there a certain system that I've created inside of my business? Did I create software that we use internally? Did, what did I create? That's specific to us, you know, and then what are we looking for? You know, then on the back end, like, what is my exit? Where do I want to actually exit? And I think it sounds simple putting it that way, but then it's actually going out there, finding the right people, giving them that system and process, making sure that it is repeatable, like dominating a marketing channel and saying, okay, I know that in this marketing channel, we can get these deals consistently all the time. And, you know, that. If this marketing channel were go away, we would dominate another one, like making sure that you have the lead flow and it's building an actual business and not a real estate company. It's building it from, I need to make sure the core pillars of a business like marketing and sales, yes. finance and operations are all working together and that the owner is not tied to any one of them and that you have systems and processes for each section because in marketing and sales, Make sure that the revenue keeps coming in, making sure you can close the deals and sell the deals if you're selling them on the back end, if you're not just buying and holding. And then if you've got, you know, the operational part would be like maybe your projects, your rehabs or whatnot, if you're doing that type of thing. And do you have a system for that? Do you have GCs in place? You know, do you have the systems down? And then on finance, do you have HR, like human resources? Like what is your hiring process? Do you have a CFO or you know, someone that's keeping up with your books and making sure that you have the right numbers, clarity, that you actually have business strategy, your funding, how are you funded? What is your debt? You know, making sure the finance pillar is strong too. And it's, you know, the, once you work on those three pillars and become better like that, that's when you know you have a sellable business. Then as a CEO, once you've nailed that down, you you sit in that seat basically of three things, culture, people, and numbers. Is our culture the right culture? Do we have the right people in place? And are our numbers on track? Like if you can keep that growing, then you can go out and then you're going to start being courted. Like you go to some of these masterminds and you just ta start talking about your business. People come up to you and ask, like, would you be interested in selling? I've seen that in these rooms because these are the people that now have that business. They're not in it as much or at all. And now they're talking about it. And then they get approached by other people in the room, which is usually the best buyers. When you're like actually going to these other people in the room and being like, "Hey, you know, this please, is please another real estate investor who gets it." So that's uh, say that again. I said that they're saying, "Please sell to me." Right, exactly. They're saying, "Please sell to me," and then then you also know you have something sellable. But right. to answer your core question, if you shore up those three pillars of your business, marketing, sales, 
as one pillar, the operations and finance, that's really where you know you're building a business and not just a real estate investing company. That, that's, I think, really, really good input and something, again, I, you just don't hear this information out there. You know, everybody talks about right. flipping a house, but not building a real business. And right. there's a big difference between the two. And one of the things that I've seen is like we're building out department structure and like best practices in each department. But then having one department communicate with another is like another process. So like you have a process yep. of how processes communicate. And um, I'm not a great person when it comes to that. So like one, one thing to keep in mind, guys, is realize where you're good and where you're not. Like I'm, I'm a great buyer. Yeah. I'm a great marketer. But when it comes to figuring out like a mind map of processes, like I'm just not the guy. So thank God for Abby in our office. She's uh, mm-hmm. a former external auditor uh, in public accounting. And so she can do all of this, which is super awesome. helpful. What's one thing that you see doing this that always surprises you? Probably that there are literally million dollar businesses and they have no idea what their numbers are. But at the same time, we're having a lot of emotional conversations with owners too. I would say your CPA and your bookkeeper are very logical and transactional for the most part. The CFO really gets into more the emotional side of it of like, we need to make sure you're healthy and the business is healthy. Do you know where you stand right now? And most owners are like, I don't even want to look at that. You know, and they're just shying away and trying to get away from it. And then that's where they could be running literally seven figures, but not know where they stand or want to know up until the time that they've reached out, because then it's usually become an an issue in their business. So that's when they're reaching out, something's breaking down and they don't know what it is, but it's getting to that level and not having any type of system or any type of just being having that clarity. That's been probably the most surprising thing for me of where I just keep having calls over and over again. The people where you would think like, oh yeah, they've got it dialed in. And they do on the marketing side, they know how to create the wealth. They just don't have anyone helping them keep the wealth on the other yeah, side. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, th- this was really, really good. And I appreciate the time. David, for those that are interested in reaching out to you, maybe they need help in their business, how can they find you? Sure. So if you go to simplecfosolutions.com, that is our fractional CFO service. If you're interested in that, we also have the Profit First REI podcast and Facebook group. If you want more of the Profit First information of like, here's how to do the cash flow management. And, you know, I want to get that out there. Like, I don't want to hold anything back. Like, if you just do that one thing, open that one profit account, transfer 1% from this call today. I will have counted this as a success because I care about you being a profitable business owner and making that a habit in your business. So simplecfosolutions.com. Then we've got the Profit First Facebook group and podcast. So to give more information out there. That sounds good. Guys, appreciate you being with us today. Feel free to reach out to David. We're going to put his info in the show notes and we will see you next time. You guys take it easy. Buy some good houses. <laughs>